Father in heaven, thank you so much for this lovely evening. Thank you for the opportunity to come and sing and worship you and uh, come and engage. Um, Jesus, as we come before you as a community, um, and I as one of the pastors here, I bring all these people here um, and ask that you would acknowledge that they are here and that they are seeking you and that you would find them. Um, and I also confess for all of us that we are in different places. Um, some of us are really excited to be here. Some of us aren't sure why we're here. Um, others of us are not even sure about you, but we, we love the pizza, and so we're here. Um, we like the food. Um, we like the people, and it's good. And, and we love the richness um, of the gift that you've given, even though we struggle to know what that means. And we just ask that you would honor that, and as we wrestle with your word, Jesus, that you would give um, that you would give us insight into what is true in our life and what you're calling us to, and that you would give us courage to step into that. And I ask all of that in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. All right, so we are in... Uh, you have my clicker, don't you, Rod? All right, so you're going to just mess with me. All right, cool. Uh, we're in the series on books of the Bible, and uh, most of you probably already know that. If you've been coming for a while, if you didn't, you just are finding out that we're going to do the book of Chronicles today. And when I built this uh, sermon schedule, I didn't include the book of Chronicles by accident. Um, so I'm making up for that, and I'm going to teach you about Chronicles. Now, last week we heard about kings. Uh, we're in the middle of the history of Israel, and we'll get to that. You can flip the slide, Rod. Um, and you can flip it again. But before we get to the history of Israel, and before we get to this book of Chronicles, I want to talk about this thing called idols. Now, as I told the morning service on a different slide, this isn't really for you. If you can't see it and you have bad eyes, it's for me. So I can kind of just talk to you. But I want to talk to you about idols. And if you don't see your idol up there, that means you're just blind. Um, I'm going to have to work. The morning service, I had Corey doing announcements, and he really worked everybody, so everybody was ready to laugh and engage, and so I'm going to have to work you guys, because Mark couldn't get you to laugh. Um, there we go. Very good. Um, and I need you to laugh before I tell you this, because idols are not something that you and I are, you know, used to, right? None of, most of you, I'm pretty sure, don't have any wooden statues in which you put lots of flowers and candles around, and then you, you know, genuflect, venerate, just to use some big you know, words, in front of those idols or attribute any power to those idols. But in the Old Testament and the New, they did. And these things were distracting and pulled the Israelites and pull you in, pulled the first century church away from God. Tonight, I want to talk to you about your idols. And when I first started working on this, I thought I'd ask you what your idols were. But I've been a pastor for 20 years, and so I'm going to tell you what your idols are. And I'm going to hopefully be a little bit hard on you, because I want to disrupt you. Because the closer we get to God, the more disrupted we should actually feel. So if you're coming to church, you should expect to be disrupted, right? D expected to have things turned up. And so I'm just going to begin to talk about your idols, and you can kind of just wrestle with it. So let's talk about the first idol that many of us have here at the village, and I will include myself in this. But one of them, the first one up there is politics. Politics is an idol for many of us because we find our identity either in the left or in the right. We find our identity in the things that we believe about the way the country should be and the principles, therefore, that, they, you know, that we're all practicing and whatever it is. But we have such a hard time associating with somebody who disagrees with us because we can't imagine why they might believe that and still be a follower of Jesus. And it's on the right and the left that this indignant, you know, in, this kind of whatever you have about it. So I know some of you've got this idol. Sometimes I play with this idol too. Um, but the one that, the next one I have up here is judgment. And I like this one. A lot of us are judgmental. And part of the reason that we're judgmental is that we're terrified of everyone else judging us. So we quickly judge everyone else. And then we do this in a way, we build these constructs about people and we put them in categories and we judge the way they behave and act so that we can be safe, so that we can kind of keep everybody at an arm's distance. It provides something for us. Now, a lot of times 
uh, when I say that fear and anxiety is an idol, everybody's like, how is fear and anxiety an idol? Well, here's how fear and anxiety is an idol. Yes, it is also a chemical, physiological experience that you have. But the thing about fear and anxiety is that it's this thing that, that kind of lets you know that you're out of control. And the more that you kind of milk that, the more that you kind of live in it, the more you are just trying to grab hold of control. So if you are wrestling with fear and anxiety as your idol, really what you're wrestling with is the need to control things. The need to control things. Your anxiety is partially pointing you to the idea that you need to be in control and you're terrified to not be in control because you don't believe that you'll be safe if you're not in control. Some of us find ourselves in kind of worshiping the construct of being helpless. We've come to the point where we just think we can't do it anymore. There's a, we have some disabilities, we have these kinds of things, and so we've just given up and we're like, we can't do it, we can't change. And so helplessness, in a way, becomes our identity. And we begin to organize our life around our helplessness, and we do not like it when other people confront us with it or say, well, maybe you aren't as helpless as you think you are. Right? So helplessness can become an idol. Now here's one that um, I certainly have, and I think a lot of us in this room have, and that is our privilege. So if you look around this room, and in particular, now I'm just going to be real honest here, in particular in the, uh, tonight, most of you are white. Okay, that's a privilege. Um, if you look at me personally, I am not only white, but I am a male, and I'm bigger than most of you. And so when I walk into the room, I get what I want most of the time. And it's partly because I'm white, big, and a man, right? And it's not a thing that I exploit consciously, but it is something that I do not appreciate anybody pointing out or taking from me because I like what it's provided for me, okay? This is an idol that I have. Now, here's one that all of you have. Everybody in the U.S. has this one, and villagers have it too. You are all worship your comfort. In fact, I was at a board game, board game night on Friday, and we were sitting around, and somebody said, and they'll say, you know, we're not going to talk about them because we don't want to stone them to death, um, but they said there, there's this, maybe there's a water shortage going to happen in the next 10 years, and there's not going to be any soda. Like, we won't have any water for Coke. And everybody got upset. Everybody was upset that maybe we would not be able to drink Coke, right? And they were like, there's no way we'll ever have a water shortage because we'll figure out how to have Coke. We will figure it out because we need Coke to survive, not water, um, right? Soda is it's a comfort thing. But, you know, and even though we were all joking at some level and being a little humorous at some level, there's a, there's, there's a, it's a picture into the reality of the idols that we worship, right, of convenience and comfort. Now, power is something that um, many of us worship, and, and particularly, it's, it's easy, it's an easy idol, because look here, what I have done is I've established a power dynamic right now. You guys don't get any voice, right? I am the pastor, I am speaking relatively harshly to you, you know, I hope you trust that I'm, I love you. Um, but I'm saying this is your problem. Now, do you see? That's a power thing. I'm standing up. I'm microphoned. I get to say how it is. Now, hopefully I do that humbly, but it's addicting. I like it. I like that you're all listening to me. I like that I can make you laugh sometimes. You guys are much harder than the morning service. Um, but I... I, <laughs> I there's a lot of people who like my sense of humor. Um, <laughs> sit down, Rod. Um, <laughs> money. Money. Money is something that we, we tend to worship in our culture. And, and, and some of it is that we, we believe that if we can get enough of it, life will be okay. And for some of us, we're organizing it so carefully because we're afraid of it being taken away from us. Right? That's an idol. Appearance. This is one that all of us wrestle with, even when we say we don't. Like, you know, a, our culture says the way you appear is a value statement of who you are, right? It's a value statement. Uh, and so we rebel and we say, no, my appearance won't define me. 
right? And so I'm going to have an anti-appearance. No, well, that's your appearance. You're still working on your appearance. You care about what people think about who you are and how you look and how you come off. A lot of us wrestle with contempt, right? We have contempt for one another because we think that we know better and we don't like the way you behave and we don't like the way you talk and we don't like the way you treat us. And so we are going to pour contempt on you because it makes us feel better and stronger, right? For others of us, theology is our idol. The way we understand who God is and what scripture says. And it's so hard for us to to have other people who might disagree. We can't possibly imagine that they know Jesus and disagree with our understanding of Scripture or the way God works with us. Now, here's one that you would be surprised, but this is the truth. The village is full, all of you, of really smart people. And even though you guys may pour contempt on yourselves for that, and try to be like, oh, I'm not that smart, I have this problem. Actually, you're all pretty smart, and you're actually pretty proud of it, right? You know you're smart, you know you're talented, right? These are idols that you and I use to give us identity, to protect us from being hurt, to give us a sense of power in a world that seems chaotic. Flip the slide for me. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen Portlandia. How many of you have seen Portlandia? About the same amount of people have seen Portlandia in the morning. So here's the thing. Never watch Portlandia except for maybe the first season. It's gotten really horrible. But in Portlandia, which is this half an hour sitcom that you can watch on Netflix, it's making fun of Portland culture. And this particular episode is put a bird on it. They put a bird, like a bird patch on everything, right? And then it's cooler when you put a bird on it. Right? And it's a hilarious, hilarious um, little half hour of TV. If you don't hear anything about Chronicles today, I want you to hear this one thing. I want you to listen to this one thing, actually, and I guess that would make you hear it. Um, is that as you wrestle with your idols, as you hopefully have been pricked just a little bit, I want you to listen to what Solomon, so David's son, when dedicating the temple, prays to God in 2 Chronicles 7, starting in verse 18. He says, But will God really dwell on the earth with humans? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you, how much less this temple I have built. Yet my Lord, my God, give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence. May your eyes be open towards this temple day and night, this place of which you said you would put your name there. May you hear the prayer your servant prays towards this place. Solomon understands that God can't dwell in a tiny little temple. Like he understands that the creator of the universe cannot be contained. He's just putting his name on one temple. Now, we've talked about this a lot when we talked about Jesus as priest, prophet, and king, but we talked a little bit about the temple. And the temple itself, just to think about it, is where heaven and earth meet. It is a small, tiny reflection of Eden and what it was like before the fall when Adam and Eve walked with God. So in this temple, there's this point where heaven and earth meet, where Israel can turn towards and pray, where they can come as a community and ask God to look at them and on them. This doesn't mean that God doesn't hear their prayers anywhere else. This is just a special place for the community. Now in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, Paul talks about what happens to you when you decide to follow Jesus and embrace, embrace the sacrifice on the cross the resurrection, and the Spirit of God. It says in Ephesians 1, 13, And now you Gentiles, he's already spoken about the Jews, have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you believe in Christ, he identifies you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. So what Paul is saying is, really, like his, God's name on the temple, you have God's name on you the Spirit of God. 
So here's the thing I want you to hear, if you don't hear anything else about Chronicles as we jump into it, is that as you wrestle with your idols, and as you struggle with the burdens of those, know that at any moment and at any time, because you have the name of God on you, you can open your mouth and speak to him, and he will turn his eyes and his heart and his way towards you. That there is no time and at no moment that you cannot be heard by God. That's If you just take a moment and think about that, the creator of all things will turn his eyes on you and give you his full attention if you open your mouth and talk to him or speak to him in your mind. If you address him, he will turn his eyes to you. He will engage. Now flip the slide. Or if you'd flip my slide for me. Making sense of exile. First and second chronicles in our Bible comes after first and second kings. I'm going to refer to it as all the other people have spoken on these books. I'm just going to refer to it as chronicles because it's one book. But it's in the wrong place in our Bible because really it's the book that should be at the end of everything because it's trying to make sense of exile. The very last king in Second Chronicles is not a king from Israel, but actually a king from Persia. In Second Chron- Chronicles 36, it says, this is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build the temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. And of his people among you, any of his people among you may go up, and may the Lord their God be with them. We've, if you've been with us for a while, when we went with Daniel, or went through Daniel, you know that all of Israel and, and all of Judah was taken into captivity and into exile, and the temple was destroyed. Chronicles ends after the Persians take over the Babylonians, and King Cyrus sends Israel back to build their temple. And so Chronicles is this book trying to make sense of what happened. What happened? Why, where, why did it go wrong? Right. And so they're trying to make sense of life after exile. So why do we have Ronda Rousey and Conor McGregor on the screen? How many of you even know who Ronda Rousey and Conor McGregor are? Just about as many of you have watched Portlandia. Okay, we're good. I am your, I am your pop culture helper-outer. That's what I'm going to do for you today. So these two people are were some of the greatest fighters in recent history in, in mixed martial arts. Ronda Rousey, was, uh, I think, got a silver in the Olympics and was brutal in the ring. Conor McGregor has like some of the most knockouts ever. These are fighters, fighters. In fact, their popularity boosted them out of the ring and into a whole bunch of different areas, you know, like being on SNL and things like that. And they made a ton of money outside of the ring. They were at the top of their game. Just like Israel was at the top of its game with King Solomon. All the world wanted to be with King Solomon, wanted to hear from King Solomon, wanted to know what King Solomon had to think. And so they were at the top of everything. Now what's interesting about these two characters is that in the ring, both of them were defeated in very humiliating ways. They were just brutalized. Right? Now, these are people who brutalized other people. But here's the thing. When you get beat up in front of a lot of people, that's really humiliating, especially when you were the big, tough person. And so these two people, if you know anything about their life, are trying to make sense at this very moment about what life is like outside of the UFC. Now, Conor McGregor's trying to figure out if he wants to come back and fight. Rhonda quit, and she does other things now and lives a better life, I think. She's kind of figured a few things out. She doesn't get punched anymore. But, um, but the reality is they're trying to make sense of things. Now, here's the thing. You and I are in the same place. That doesn't matter if you, don't believe in, if you believe in Jesus or not. You know that you are a person of exile and you don't belong here, right? That there's something wrong. When you get up in the morning and your body aches, the older you get, you know there's something wrong, right? We live in a culture that is moving so fast that I can know about all of the, ma- the massacres of our, in our country. 
I can know about the fact that my neighbor's mail got stolen. I know, and you can know that I got a hedgehog because it's, you know, who knows, maybe it's on Instagram by now. I don't know. Um, okay, it's on Instagram. Thank you. Um, you can, you know about what's happening probably in Africa and the different rape camps. You can know about all of this information within 30 seconds almost. All this, and you're trying to digest it. Now, here's an interesting stat, that in 1999 to 2000, in that one year, there was more information produced than had ever been produced in world history because of the internet. Now, think about that from 2000 to 2000. 19, because we are just endlessly producing. I mean, how many people here at some point in time thought they were a blogger of some kind or has posted some kind of information on? Every single one of you has at least typed something in and produced some information and put it out into the world. The only false stuff for Ron. But here's the thing. We are all trying to make sense of life. right? And it's kind of like for Israel and for us, we're on a boat in a storm and we're trying to just stand up. Right? And so Chronicles is written to answer the question. You can flip the slide, Rod. Rod, can you flip the slide, please? Chronicles is written to answer this question, what happened? You can flip it one more time because, again, my slides are not done right. Um, that's all my fault anyway. And the answer they come up with is in 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 1. All of Israel was listed in the genealogies recorded in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. They were taken captive to Babylon because of their unfaithfulness. Now, here's, here's the thing. You might not have known this, but the entire Bible is about marriage. From the beginning to the end, it's metaphor after metaphor after metaphor after metaphor about marriage. And so when, when Israel is saying the reason we went into Babylon and into captivity was because we were unfaithful, it is a kind of marriage thing. That we betrayed the trust of our marriage to God. And so we were sent in to exile. I want you to hold on to that, and I'm going to give you a two-minute review of over 60 chapters. So you ready for that? You're going to have to flip backwards, Rod. Two-minute summary, okay? And then we're going to get to business and talking about this unfaithfulness. First Chronicles, chapter 1 through 9, is a genealogy. Real boring, but important to read. It is all about David. It is a David-centric genealogy. Because the question that Israel is asking is, why don't we have a forever king? What's happened to him? And so they're going to wrestle with who is the right king. What, you know, they're going to start kind of asking questions about this. And so this genealogy is David's genealogy, but it's also the priestly genealogy through Aaron. If you like genealogies, read it. If the genealogy is going to, not, is going to make you not read Chronicles, skip it. If you don't care, listen to it on an audio recording, and then read. I don't care. You should at least read it once in your lifetime. Um, First Chronicles, then 10, should be 10 to 29, is just most of David's reign, but it's all the positive things. So it's not the stuff in Samuel. There's no adultery, no murder. The only real bad thing that David does in this one is that God says, don't count people. And he says, why not? I'm going to do that. And then things don't go very good for him. Um, but that's really the only down thing. Most of it is how great David was as a king. In those chapters. In fact, in chapter 22 to 29, it's David preparing and organizing all the things that need to happen to build the temple um, and prepare it for Solomon. And 2 Chronicles chapter 1 through 9 is Solomon building the temple, Solomon dedicating the temple, Solomon building his palace, Solomon building endless amounts of gold shields and spears, and then and he just kind of I don't, what do you do with a gold shield? I don't know what you do with a gold shield. I guess you hang it on the wall. You have a parade with your gold shield, and you're really sparkly. Um, but then in 2 Chronicles 10 through 36, the kingdom is divided. So here's what happens. Solomon dies, and Solomon's son and the elders kind of get into an argument, and the kingdom, they go to civil war, and the kingdom is split. And we have the northern kingdom of Israel, which is the ten tribes of Israel, and then the southern kingdom, which is Judah and Benjamin. And this is where the temple is, and this is where the worship of God is. Now, in the northern kingdom of Israel, 
we heard a lot of that discussion last week in First and Second Kings. They had golden calves because they didn't want anybody going down to the southern kingdom. You just worship the calf and that'll work out for you. Now, in Chronicles, as they're trying to make sense of what went wrong, there are about 20 kings, um, and 15 of them aren't that great, and five of them are pretty good. So I could spend a lot of time just talking about all those, but we're, we're only going to talk about one. But the last chapter of Second Chronicles, so uh, Second Chronicles chapter 36, is the destruction of Jerusalem and everything being wiped out, and then Cyrus saying, hey, you can now go back. So everything, everything's kind of finished out in chapter 36. So let me flip the slide, Rod. We, and again, we are going to talk about King Asa. Now, King Asa is one of my more favorite kings that I like to read as a kid um, because he mostly gets it right, and he's the king with the foot fungus. So we're going to talk about that. But anyway, so if you flip the slide, I'm going to read to you a little bit of his story. King Asa um, shows up in 2 Chronicles chapter 15 and 16. So we're going to start in chapter 15, verse 1. The Spirit of God came to Azariah, son of Obed, and he went out to meet Asa, and he said to him, Listen to me, Asa and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. All right. Now, if you remember, at the beginning of Joshua, there's a warrior right before they go attack Jericho. And in the morning, Joshua is up, you know, trying to prepare for things. And he sees the warrior and he goes to the warrior and says, are you for us or for our enemies? And he says, neither or no, right? This is a theme that goes through the Old Testament. It's not God is with Israel, Israel was with God or not with God. And so this is emphasized to King Asa. The Lord is with you when you are with him. That's important for you to hear. When you're with God, God is with you. Then he says, if you seek him, he will be found by you. Now here's the interesting thing about seeking. It's not that God got lost and you need to go find him. The seeking is actually a marriage kind of term. It's a term, a relational term. This kind of seeking is you studying your spouse at the level that you are trying to proclaim and talk about their beauty, their inner beauty, their outer beauty, all the things about them. Seeking, in this context, and this, this word, is you learning, talking, expressing your knowledge of your spouse or of God. So if you are seeking God, you are speaking about, about who God is. You're trying to figure out more about who God is. You're telling everybody who God is. That's how you find him. Now, when it says he will be found by you, he's not hiding. God is not hiding. In fact, the way, the way it is, is if you could imagine a field, it's God, real big, tall guy standing in the middle of the field, very visible, and you and I have been spending our life going around like this. Where's God? Where's God? Can't find him. Can't find him. Can't find him. Oh, there he is. Oh, hi, God. It's kind of, it's kind of like when a little one-year-old is toddling around and they know where mom is and then all of a sudden they lose sight of mom and they start freaking out and then they see mom and you just see like sort of all their face relax. Oh, there's mom. This is what's being talked about here is that God is... Right there, all you have to do is begin to talk about him, focus on him, and you will find him. Right? He will show up. Now, he goes on to say, but if you forsake him, he will forsake you. The important thing you need to note about this is this is an active word, you forsaking. This second word is a passive word. This word forsake is, is the same root and idea that happens when uh, it says in Genesis and also in Ephesians that the man will leave his mother and father. So that leave is literally a breaking of a bone. Okay, so his, the man will forsake his mother and father, and then he will cleave to his wife, meaning he will refuse that bone. So you're forming a new family. So it's a divorce term. So in some ways you could think it this way, but if you divorce him, he will be divorced. That's what's being said here. It's not he will divorce you, he will forsake you, he will 
be divorced. So if you choose to divorce God, forsake God, then he will be forsaken. But he's not going anywhere. It's not like he's like, fine, I'm out of here. He's in the same place, but because of what you've done, his status is divorced. Okay? But here's the cool thing about this passage. It's very Hebrew and that it's not, it doesn't, this period is not an ending. In fact, it goes back up. So the idea is if you're with God, then he'll be with, he'll be with you. And if you seek him, he'll be found by you. But if you forsake him, he'll be forsaken. But if you go right back up and you're with him and you seek him, he'll be found by you. He's not going anywhere. Okay? The found and the second forsake are passive. They're results of what you've chosen and can be reinstituted. This is an important thing because this is the invitation that God gives us and gives Israel. And this is the reason that Israel found itself in the place it was at because it would not return to the top. It wouldn't go be with Jesus or with God. So it goes on. It says, For a long time Israel was without the true God. So now the narrator jumps in. Without a priest to teach and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. Okay. I want to talk about this word distress. And to to understand this word distress, I want to tell you a little story that happened in 1 Samuel. Now, David, the king, the first king, had not yet become king. And Saul's chasing him everywhere. And he and his little band of men return to their little village. And what happens is all of their wives and kids are gone. And it says that the, the idea of the text is that the people were so distressed, his soldiers, that they wanted to stone David because they were upset, which is you know makes sense. And David it says, encouraged himself in the Lord. So they're distressed. So you can flip my slide, Rod. This idea of distress and encouragement has to do with binding, okay? So here's kind of the idea in this picture. David's men bound themselves to their distress, and it shaped their behavior. So they come, and all of their children and wives are gone, they freak out, and they want to stone David. So they've bound themselves to their distress, and it leads them to a choice that's destructive, or at least contemplating a a choice that could be really bad for them. David, on the other hand, in the middle of that distress, this idea of encouraged himself in the Lord is a binding, so he bound himself to the Lord so he could face the situation, okay? So this, this is important because all of us are bound to our distress. That's normal, right? We are bound to our idols. We are bound to our circumstances. We are bound to the events that happen to us, and they create great distress. Now, this word distress is like having your head in a vice or being in a narrow canyon with enemies on top of you ready to shoot you, right? You, we're all bound to the distress, But in it, it says, Israel cried out for God. They turned around, and there he was. Now, here's the thing. When you pray to God and you begin to ask him to intervene and you are distressed and you are bound to the circumstances that you are in, it doesn't change things. In fact, it usually looks pretty bleak. Listen to what the text says. They were found... But it says, in those days, it was not safe to travel about, for all the inhabitants of the land were in great turmoil, one nation being crushed by another, and one city by another, because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. But for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Okay. First, just so you don't get distracted here. It says that God was creating distress, right? But remember the little loop that you go through. When people divorce themselves from God, forsake God, then God is not present. And God's absence of involvement there, I mean, he's present, but he's forsaken. And so his absence is him causing distress. It's not like he's like, fine, you 
decided to divorce me, so I'm going to create distress. No, it's the very absence of God that creates chaos. If you decide to walk away, to turn your back, there's going to be chaos. So the, the whole world is in chaos. God comes to this community. They call out to God. I mean, the, the prophet comes. They call out to God, and God says, okay, here I am, but you are going to need to be strong and I'll read this to you again, but it says, but as for you, be strong and do not give up for your work will be rewarded. All right, so this be strong is the same word that you, where it says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Be strong and courageous. They, these work is combined together. And so what it's saying is, okay, bind yourself to God. Things are distressing. Things are chaotic. The information and chaos of our world is, is, we know it's just crazy. The invitation then of, of this particular text is, all right, bind yourself to God and stand. So being strong has this idea of standing. You have your arm bound to God. So you can imagine your arm bound to God. And now you need to stand or be rooted. And in martial arts, there is this idea in some martial arts that you, when you get into your stance, that you imagine that your feet grow roots into the ground so that you can't be moved, okay? So the picture here is, all right, this is going to be a difficult thing. You need to be strong. And then it says, the interesting part here, it says, do not give up, which the NIV, it's, it's a weird translation. It's literally the word yad. And the word yad in Hebrew is the word for a pointer that you use, or a beeper, a pointer that you use to read the Torah because you can't touch the Torah because it's too holy. So when you're reading it, if you point, you go, well, I guess you go like this because you're reading this direction. Um, so it's a little metal finger pointer so you know where you're at. So this idea here is that bind yourself to God, be strong, root yourself, and go in the direction of God. Go in the direction of holy, and you'll be rewarded. You're getting a lot of emails in there. <laughs> you, down <laughs> you downloaded the Bible. Okay, now the Bible's being downloaded. Well, at least it's something holy happening up here. All right. So, so when, here's the thing, though. When you pray in the midst of your distress, God asks you to act action happens you are invited to act when you find god when your life is being disrupted when the idols of your life are being disrupted god invites you to act listen to what happens as asa hears this these words of the prophet when asa heard these words and the prophecy of azariah son of obed the prophet he took courage he bound himself to god and then he acted he removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin and from the towns he had captured <laughs> in the hills of Ephraim. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. You don't have to go anywhere, Ron. It's just making me laugh. Okay. You can flip the slide here so we can have some toppled idols. When you pray in your distress and you find God, God invites you to aggressively go after your idols and to topple them down. So he invites me to go after my privilege. He invites you to go after your judgment and your, what, you put it in, you put whatever it is in there. Like the invitation will be to go after those idols and make decisive actions against them to do something dramatic now just think about this we read this and we think oh well, that's nice do you understand that a whole two tribes of israel get up in the morning and worship these idols that they're knocking down they get up and they show up and they're like oh the idols have been knocked down Asa has stepped into a very risky place and said, I am going to change the worship of my community. That's dangerous. You risk not being king anymore when you attack people's idols, right? 
But that's even true for us. We risk rejection when we begin to tra- transform and to be transformed. The other thing that happens, though, is that he establishes relationship with God. He rebuilds the front of the porch of the temple. Now, let's flip the slide around. The question that Israel has in Chronicles is what went wrong. We sort of have a promised land, but it's been invaded. We sort of have a temple now, but it has to be built. We don't have the king that we want. The question that you and I have to ask, no matter where we are with Jesus, is what's going wrong? Because the reality is, is that most of us do not experience the peace of Christ. In fact, that list of idols that you saw that I put up there, the ones that you hold on to create a chaos and an anxiety and a lack of peace in your life. So so how do we go about making decisive action against our idols? What does that look like? Well, Paul in uh, Colossians 3, 15 through 17 offers us a picture of what the church looks like, and I want to offer you a way of going about this. Colossians 3, 15 through 17 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, give, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Toppling down your idols is not you figuring out, okay, I'm just a real proud person. I need to figure out the steps to being humble. I think I'll Google it. Right? That, that is not how it works. Scripture is very clear that the way you topple your idols is that you bring them into the light. The way that you and I receive peace is that we come into this service. We come in into a Sunday evening or a Sunday morning space and we say, I am a proud person and I have bound myself to my pride. I need someone to unbind me. I need you to take the ropes off because they are too tight and I can't get them off. And, you, and we, you need to come into the community when it says we need to admonish one another, we need to sing songs and hymns. Part of that is saying, bind me to Jesus. You're asking me, you're asking one another, you're asking as we sing to be bound to Jesus. That, there, that the way that you and I both topple the idols and establish relationship is to come humbly into the community and bring the idol to light by saying, this is where I'm tied and I can't get off, get it off, right? I've just tied way too many knots and it's just my fingers are too chubby to get it off. That's, that's what attacking your idols is. That's what God invites you into when you cry out in distress. And what happens is, that you will find the peace of Christ ruling your life when you're willing to bring things to light. Now, here's the thing that in recovery that we that you talk about a lot, and I think it's important in this process to think about bringing your idols to light in your life, is that there are three ideas when it comes to dealing with your addictions. One is that you have to be 100% brutally authentic. It's not, off, and when we're talking about brutal authenticity, we're not talking about me going to you and saying, I don't like the way you X, Y, and Z. Brutal authenticity is saying, here is my idol. Here is my addiction. This is who I am. The second one is that we have to leave the results up to God. That's the part of being found by God, is that the results are up to him. The transformation is up to him. All we do is come into a community of of people who love Jesus and say, this is who I am. This is how I'm bound. Right? So we have the brutal authenticity. We have the results being left up to, um, (coughs) excuse me, left up to God. And the third one, 
I couldn't get it, could I? I got the, I forgot. Do you remember what it is? Help me out here. Somebody who was here in the morning service, I just totally blanked, and it's not in my notes. Come on, guys. You guys don't remember? All right, well, that's fine. Well, I'll, it'll, it'll hit me in a minute as I talk about something else, because it's super important to what we're going to talk about, but <laughs> obviously those who are in the service don't remember it. Um, that's okay. It's on a recording. We'll remember. So here's what happens, though. That's going to bug me. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Leave the results. I'll rem- I'll remember it in a minute. Golly. It's good. But here's the thing. When you step into a community and you cry out to God and you're willing to offer your idols and bring them to light and you are in the process of transformation, it is really easy to get to the place to believe that you are the one who's doing things that you're the one that's changing you, that you're the one that's bringing the blessings from your obedience. And so you begin to try to deal with your problems on your own again. And what happens is King Asa ends up in a space where he has tons of peace and he's won lots of victories and his honoring of God has been a benefit to him. And then the northern kingdoms become to push against his kingdom and they are are the northern Israel, Israel actually, wants to come and press against Judah. And so instead of asking God to help, he goes and he, plunt, he takes all of the good stuff out of the temple and the palace and he goes and gives it to this king and that king helps him out and then he has peace and then here comes the prophet. At that time, Hanai the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said to him, because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hand. Were not the Cushites and the Libyans, a mighty army with great numbers of chariots and horsemen. Yet when you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you will be at war. So he gets really mad about this. And he's like a little kid because he's like, why isn't God going to honor me trying to figure it out? And so he throws the seer in jail and he gets a little violent. But, even then, but then the text goes on to say that as he's dying, he has this horrible foot fungus, and he refuses to seek the Lord, only his physicians, and so he dies. Right? So he dies with athlete's foot, and maybe he could have had it fixed for him. Right? He could have entered back in and been with God and been found by God. He didn't have to stop there, but this is what happens. What happens is that when you and I are confronted with the divorce that we have basically done, the forsaking of God, we're like, no, you can't, no. And instead of saying, oh God, I'm sorry, please forgive me, and re-entering, yeah, there are consequences, but going back to be with God and seeking God and finding him, instead of entering back into that rhythm, we just push ourselves further and further away. And so so it should be a warning to us as we step into community, as we offer the things that we're bound to, as we experience healing, that we choose to stay connected to God. And when we're confronted with running away from God, we don't stubbornly run faster, but that we turn around. (coughs) I think I have some... No, I don't. Oh, my gosh. Did we start late? We had to start late. Five minutes. We don't have time for questions. Let's pray. Sorry, guys. Jesus, thank you so much for today. I just ask that you would uh, bless our time as we sing and as we eat together um, and as we worship you. Amen.